Hey everyone, Rogue Gold here, and here it is, by far the most popular video request I've gotten over the past 48 hours. Today, I am bringing you a complete guide for the new Paradise Lost Incursion. My team and I had a phenomenally paced 3 hour, 13 minute clear time on day 1. Thank you so much to everybody who tuned into that stream, it was a ton of fun, and so today, with that knowledge... I'm going to be going over the mechanics and strategy for each of the incursions for encounters, as well as giving tips, build recommendations, and other useful information for each one. Keep in mind that I can only recommend stuff based off of my experience with the incursion strategies that my team employed and had success with, so just know that these are by no means the only way to be successful within the mode, and different builds and techniques are going to work differently for every team, so use this as a reference point if nothing else. Only other thing I wanted to mention is that I intend to only focus on main encounters of the incursion here, the boss battles and the other primary fights. I won't be covering the different mini segments and puzzle rooms, as they aren't integral to any mechanics or loot, and I want to keep this focused on parts of the incursion that people actually need guidance to overcome. So yeah, if you enjoy this and find it helpful, a like would be super appreciated on the video. And this took a lot of work to put together so quickly, so it would make my day if you would consider clicking that subscribe button. Plus, you won't miss out on my future videos, so what's there to lose? But with that said, let's get straight into this. Timestamps will be down below for you to skip around to whatever section you need. But before we get to the first encounter, I want to quickly go over one of my top build recommendations, and that is my Heartbreaker DPS build that I ended up using on pretty much every encounter. Now that's not to say that DPS is all you will need, there are other vital roles that I will cover later, but this is what I use the most by far. And if you're heading into Paradise Lost via matchmaking or just wanting options, I highly suggest that you have this or something similar saved to your loadouts. Heartbreaker is super effective in this incursion for two reasons. One, the cleaners as a faction pretty much always have a headshot hitbox, as opposed to, say, the Black Tusk, so stack building is super easy here. And two, the added functionality of Heartbreaker granting you bonus armor is going to help a lot with you offering that extra safety net on a lot of these fights. Some more pro players will likely opt for Striker, that is a totally valid option too with a higher damage ceiling. Only reason I recommend this, like I said, it's just more consistent in my view, and I think will be better adopted by a wider range of players. Once again, there are many ways you can set up Heartbreaker, I chose to do so as follows. You need the Heartbreaker chest piece in order to be able to build those full 100 stacks. Other than that, we're running the ninja bike, so you only need two more pieces of Heartbreaker in any slot you like. And then I'm also running two pieces of Striker for that three-piece rate of fire bonus. It may seem counterintuitive to give up on those other damage options here, but the lethality that this thing unlocks on the Kingbreaker is quite surprising, and evident by the gameplay, this is super effective. On every piece, I have weapon damage and headshot damage rolled. I'm not specking into crit whatsoever here, it is headshot all the way and that is to line up with the functionality of Heartbreaker where headshots pulse enemies and it's just the best way to build stacks. Primary gun, Kingbreaker here, as I mentioned, accuracy and headshot mods on the gun. Running an ACS-12 secondary is going to help immensely with building your stacks fast. I recommend either the lefty so you have a sledgehammer or the rock and roll so you have that extra magazine size. You could also run a Scorpio, just be sure to land a headshot in order to pulse the target off of Heartbreaker. Now I'm also running the firewall specialization and that is primarily to unlock the striker shield which grants huge damage for enemies in front of me and is just super useful in this scenario of an incursion. So that is the general overview of a really solid DPS build for this, let's move on. Paradise Lost starts you out in the gardens of the Merit Estate, and this is where our first encounter occurs. The first open yard features a few ad spawns, nothing too crazy, but once you head up the stairs on the left or right side is when the estate's front turrets will activate, and these are your main targets to disable in order to complete the encounter. The turrets are immune to all damage, you cannot simply shoot them to take them down. Rather, if you look directly below each one, you'll see a narrow opening. The large yellow cable connected from each turret runs through there, and these windows also have a big white arrow painted next to them, so you should be able to see them pretty easily. And what you have to do is to climb onto an elevated surface, it's the wooden structure on the left side of the map and the garbage truck on the right, and by aiming through the windows you'll find an explosive stack sitting just beyond. It has a limited health pool, and all you have to do is take that down and that side's turret will be deactivated. Do this on both sides, clear all of the NPCs, and you beat the encounter. It's harder than it sounds, however, as this room is full of high-level cleaners, there are mortars that are going to be raining down on you at all times, and the turrets themselves are super lethal. So how do we beat it? My first recommendation is to stay mobile and be aware of your surroundings. You're going to want to stay with your team, but not bunched up so tightly that you're pinning each other down with mortars. So whatever builds you bring to this, just stay on the move. The team composition that worked best for us here was to have one full tank build with a tardigrade and high health bulwark shield, a dedicated healer build, as well as two dedicated DPS builds. 
NPCs are going to continually spawn into the arena until you deactivate both turrets. So of course you should clear out any that are in your way, but there's no real prepping for an ideal moment. You're just going to need to push up and get the job done. The general idea is to pick a side to start on left or right. The tank walks out and takes the turret's aggro. One DPS player focuses on suppressing any NPCs present, while the other climbs onto the garbage truck or wooden structure, depending on if you're on the right or left, and the healer keeps everybody alive. That is a pretty foolproof method that worked great for my team, and it should work for yours as well. Once you do it on one side, back up and recharge any cooldowns you may have, and then repeat it on the other side, clear all the ads, and voila, you're done. One tip I will give here is to watch out for a manhole cover that is on the right and left side right by those elevated surfaces you climb onto. When you hear the creak of it opening, that means that a cleaner heavy unit is about to climb out, and that should be a top priority for you to take down. Now moving on, we get to encounter number two, the tanker defense. Now in concept, this one is quite simple. There's a big tanker in the center of the arena, it has a health bar, and all you need to do is defend it against several waves of cleaners and don't allow them to shoot it. There's some elements thrown in here to make that concept much more difficult, however, so let's go over those. Firstly, this encounter is your first introduction to one of this incursion's unique mechanics, and that is this purple fire. It basically acts like normal fire, except that once it ignites, it leaves a permanent burn on the ground where it reacts. So even once the fire cloud is gone, that area will continue to burn, meaning if you walk over it, it will reignite you and you will take huge chunks of damage. This is the stuff that the tanker is filled with, and it will continue to leak more and more of it the more damage it takes, and that is all the more reason to effectively protect it. Additionally, there are a few fire barrels placed around the map, so just do your best not to hit them and close off more ground space. Now, the enemy waves that you will get consist of three varieties. Your normal wave is just a normal wave of cleaner opponents. They don't have any specific tracking onto the tanker, meaning as long as you're running around and grabbing their aggro, they're more likely to shoot you rather than the tanker. So just be sure to do that and take them out at your own pace. Then there's what we'll call a focus wave, and this comes every few waves of enemies and consists of, I would say, three to four heavy cleaner units down on the ground level with the tanker, as well as two cleaner snipers that show up on the top left and right elevated positions. Now it's called a focus wave because these enemies AI are designed to hit the tanker no matter what, meaning speed is of the essence to dispose of them as fast as possible. Now you'll hear this wave coming out by that same distinct manhole creaking noise as it opens and the heavies climb out, and all of the enemies in this wave will get one of those diamond markers above their heads, making it easier to spot them out. Keep in mind that the cleaner heavy units have miniguns as opposed to flamethrowers, and they will chunk that tanker down very quickly, so you have to be coordinated and direct when these waves occur. And lastly, you have the drone wave. This only happens once in the encounter, approximately three quarters of the way through, and three boss level striker drones spawn in. They hurt, they're kind of tanky. Fortunately, they don't aggressively target the tanker, so again, as long as you take their aggro and work on taking them down, you'll be good, but they can catch you off guard, so be prepared. There's one surprise left, however, and that is that this encounter features one of those final stand mechanics that a lot of raids in other games will use. Once you clear out the final wave of enemies, the game kind of lulls you into a false sense of security by saying, oh, go ahead and open the door to the next room. But as you approach, it will burst open and a final boss is waiting behind with a minigun and his goal is to finish the tanker off. So you all need to just group up at that door and take him out ASAP. As far as recommendations and strategies for this room, the team comp that worked for us was to have three DPS builds and a skill build utilizing a turret and a healing hive. That person also used the BTSU gloves to be able to overcharge the whole team. And that was just nice to ensure we had these bursts of power. We kept the cooldowns up on our revive hives, things like that. As far as damage builds, at least one to two of those heartbreaker builds I showcased will work super well here. And here's a super pro tip. The final stand boss's minigun fire can be blocked by anything standing in its path. Meaning that using something like a striker shield that I showcased in the build can be super effective at granting everyone those few seconds of damage to make sure he gets put down. Other than that, this is a pretty simple quote unquote wave defense encounter. It'll take you a few tries just to learn the spawns of the focus wave, the timing of the drone wave. Once you do that and you designate who's watching which areas, it shouldn't give you too much trouble. So good luck. Moving on, we come to our first real boss encounter, and easily, I would say this is one of the coolest boss designs in the Division franchise. And that is Wright, the Flaming Hunter that they featured pretty prominently in the marketing. Now this fight can seem hectic and overwhelming, but once you figure out what's going on, it's really just about falling into a good rhythm with your team, so let me explain the gist here. Wright is covered in that same purple fire that we covered, which makes him immune from all damage. The way you remove this is by having someone grab his aggro, and this is denoted by the red eye that will show up in the middle of your screen if you have it. That person needs to run him underneath one of the many sprinklers that are in the room, 
and a secondary teammate then needs to crank the valve of that corresponding sprinkler system, and it will douse the flame and open up a damage window for you and your team of about 10-ish seconds. So in essence, you just need to rinse and repeat that until he is dead. The room has four different sets of sprinklers and therefore four corresponding valves, and all four of these valves are in the room that Wright spawns into and bursts his way out of in the beginning of the fight. So once that happens, you can run in there and see where they are. Now to know which valve corresponds to which sprinklers, there are two ways to tell. Firstly, there is a hand-drawn map on the wall next to each valve that shows you exactly where it leads to. But alternatively, you can also just look visually at where the copper pipe is heading and follow it to its destination. You have a sprinkler system on the two sides of the arena as well as two in the middle, one farther forward and one farther back. The callouts we used as a team were left, right, stage for the immediate middle placement where right begins the fight at, and middle for the lower down spot at the center of the room. It's important that you don't need to try and look up to see where the sprinkler is and try and get him directly underneath it. Rather, the white tile ornaments on the floor are those exact sprinkler ranges. So if a teammate were to say, bring him to left side sprinkler, you as the aggro holder would just need to lure him to one of those white tile spots on the left side and call out for the dousing. And this is generally the strategy that is going to work out here. Somebody will have the aggro, they run him around, and then back in the valve room, those valves use the same number system as the Iron Horse Raid to denote how close they are to being ready to release water. The closer it gets to 100, the closer it is to being ready to use. It will light up green when it is ready, and you're good to go. So have a teammate watching for a valve, call which position, left, right, stage, or middle. The aggro holder brings him there, douse with water, deal damage. This is going to take you several damage phases to kill him off, and there are a few additional things that you need to be aware of. For one, NPCs will periodically spawn into the room. Fortunately, it's not a constant thing, meaning that when they did spawn in, my team and I generally made that our sole focus to clear them out, and from there we would continue with our damage phases uninterrupted. Additionally, you'll notice on Wright's health bar that there are three distinct lines, and each time you bring his health past one of them, he's going to do somewhat of a special attack. He will stop chasing you, begin to charge up, and the room will fill with purple smoke. Now do not worry, this isn't lethal. The best thing you can do at this point is just to move away from him and break line of sight. He will then blast outward. You'll take damage from it, but you shouldn't die. But what this does is it leaves a pool of that purple fire, meaning that portion of the room that he was standing in is no longer accessible, at least not if you don't want to burn to death in an instant. So the further the fight goes, it will get more hectic because of that, but as long as you're smart about it and communicate well, you should be fine. Our team utilized one dedicated healer build and three full DPS builds for this fight. I think generally that's going to provide you with the power needed to quickly take out NPCs as well as maximize damage windows on right, but also having the healer just helps you stay alive in the chaos. And one tip I will give you for this is that if you are the person carrying Wright's aggro, do not stop running. At least to me, it seemed like he is much faster than pretty much any other enemy I've seen in the game. He won't outrun you, but he'll be right on your tail, so if you slow down even for just a second, you're at risk. He does this big AoE attack with his axe, and if you get caught up in it, not only does it deal huge damage, but it also traps you in that tar-like status effect that you then have to break out of, which gives him a pretty good chance to hit you again. So, stay on the move at all times. All right, and that means that lastly we come to the Lovebirds, the final boss encounter of the incursion. The fight involves two individual bosses, Johnson and Martinez, and while their mechanics are very intertwined, it is important to note the differences between them. Martinez is a very classic cleaner heavy type unit. She is a flamethrower and will get right up in your face, whereas Johnson prefers to stay at a bit of range, but he also has access to some super lethal shade tech that you need to watch out for, namely his sniper turret, as well as a few other things that we'll touch on shortly. But here is the basic gist of the fight. The lovebirds will roam around the arena, and while one of them is constantly being protected by a drone titled The Kid, whoever is being protected by The Kid is immune to damage, but the other one is not. However, if you begin to damage the other one enough, they will then trade off who has The Kid and send it to the other lovebird. Now normally the kid itself is also immune to damage, however in this transitional period where it's flying between the two, it can be damaged. And by doing this a number of times, eventually destroying the kid is the main mechanic of this fight. So how do we do it effectively? Well, both Johnson and Martinez have an aggro that can be gained and held. Martinez's is the red eye while Johnson's is a green eye, so keep that in mind. And think about it, in order to have the maximum possible damage window on the kid, you're going to want the two lovebirds to be as far away from each other as possible. So, when the fight starts, the best strategy is to shoot, get close to, or whatever you need to do to get one of the lovebirds aggro, communicate with your teammates and figure out who has the aggro of the other one, 
and then those two people need to go to the opposite corners of the room and hold the bosses there. The remaining two players then need to alternate between whichever lovebird is not being protected by the kid. Again, damaging that one enough will trigger the drone transition, and in that period, primarily the two roaming players, but really anyone with line of sight, should unload everything they can on the kid. Now a little tip here, it's important to note that you can continue damaging the kid once it arrives at that other lovebird until the little red circle icon completes its full duration. Now once you do eventually destroy the kid, this is how you enter the true damage phase. You will be damaging the bosses to trigger the drone transitions, but this usually ends up getting healed in some way or another. In my mind, I think it's much more effective to just consider this section as the true damage phase. Once the kid dies, the lovebirds will regroup at the center balcony area that they originally spawned at, and then Johnson will trigger a several second animation to redeploy a new kid. Now our strategy in this fight was to eliminate Johnson with extreme prejudice. As I mentioned, before he has access to a sniper turret that is just on another level of pain but he also has a healing box which yeah will heal back up any damage that you've dealt so during this damage phase all four of you are going to want to damage johnson as much as possible for as long as possible and there's a couple of ways that you can enhance this Firstly, in order to minimize Martinez igniting or otherwise damaging you, we found it super useful to have our damage builds running decoys, and these can be thrown towards the edge of the balcony in order to make the bosses face away from you. And it seemed like it could also distract Johnson for a few extra moments before he went in to redeploy the kid. We ran a healer build that overcharged our decoys for even more potency, but I'll cover that more in a minute. In my opinion, the best placement for this damage phase is to stick two players on each side of the balcony to the left and right walkways. That way you can easily escape if you need to, and you're not clustered up in case of any potential zone attacks. So, once your skills are out and the damage phase has begun, you're gonna want to unleash everything you have onto Johnson. I'm talking sledgehammer, grenade debuff, full striker stack headshots. He's very stationary, so whatever you can do to maximize your damage, the better. You won't be able to kill him in one go, so keep that in mind, but you're gonna want to do as much as you can. Now this is very important, once Johnson completes the kid redeploy, a flare will shoot up from where they are, and when you see that, you need to run. Because this signifies that the lovebirds have just called in a mortar strike, these mortars do far more damage and have a much wider range than the ones back in the first encounter, so during this you just need to run, run, run. Luckily they don't last permanently, they will subside, after which I recommend you just clear out any NPCs that may have spawned in, and then you're back to the kid phase of the fight. Two people grab Martinez and Johnson's aggro, you pull them away from each other and whittle down the kid. And you continue this build up and damage phase cycle however many times you need to until you're eventually able to kill Johnson. Now there is one very important thing to note, I know what happens when Johnson hits around 50% health, I don't know if it can happen more or exactly what triggers it, but he will place down a healing box on the ground right in between he and Martinez during that damage phase window. And when that happens, it needs to be called out and all four of you need to immediately take your aim off of Johnson and burst down that box. It will heal the bosses back up and we don't want that happening. Other than that, that's really the loop. You take down the kid, you focus Johnson, you kill him, once that happens, Martinez will enter a kind of enraged state uh, where she'll be much more aggressive. Basically, all you need to do is then kite her around the map, slowly take her down when you can. There will be a few sporadic mortar shots and NPCs spawning in at this point, so just take it slow. But by killing Johnson first, you eliminate the risk of those sniper turrets and those other lethal elements, so you should be alright. For this fight, our team kept the exact same setup as the right boss battle. One dedicated healer and three full DPS builds. I'm sure there are other compositions that work, that is just what felt right to us. The healer was able to pretty comfortably trade off between roaming and healing and hunkering down and taking on one of the lovebirds aggro. And they also ran the BTSU exotic gloves which allowed them to overcharge all of us and power up those decoys during the damage phase. As for the damage builds, again plenty of options here, Heartbreaker works great, I would say that Striker is even more viable in this fight because of the robotic elements like the kid and the sniper turret, so whatever works best for you. As for any outstanding tips, it is a hectic fight, it's going to take a while just to get the flow down, it's going to be frustrating, you just need to stick with it and lock in that communication. The sniper turret is definitely one really rogue element, no pun intended. It deals an insane amount of damage and is also very tanky, and even if you destroy it, Johnson will usually just throw another one right back out. So our team never really came up with an exact science on how to deal with it, we just tried to call out where it was and avoid its line of sight if we could. And if the opportunity was present, then we would shoot it down. But there you have it people, that is an overview of the Lovebirds fight and the Paradise Lost incursion as a whole. I really hope this guide was helpful and aids you in conquering the Division 2's first incursion. This kind of content is always super difficult at release, so if you're struggling with it, don't feel too discouraged. 
It always takes people a few weeks to really learn the fights, how it all ticks. And I do think that when we look back at this content, it will be favorably. I found it to be a super fun incursion and piece of content overall. So I hope you enjoy it as well as find success with the help of this guide. If you want further details on how the Incursion's exclusive exotic reward works, I've already released a short guide on that that you can check out in the top corner as well as in the description down below. But yeah, if you have any questions about the Incursion, things you're still confused about, stuck on, do let me know and I will do my best to help out. But that is going to do it for me today, everybody. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Rogue Gold. Ow.